Hello and welcome to another episode of the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast with me, your host, Paul Swindell. This episode, I'm going to be talking about one of my favourite words since I've had a cardiac arrest, and that word is sequelae. Basically, I want this episode to help you to understand the issues that you might be going through since you've um, had your cardiac arrest. And we've got to remember that a cardiac arrest is different from other diseases and conditions because it's an event and there are many reasons for having a cardiac arrest and uh, Sudden Cardiac Arrest UK is a result of people coming together who have had one through primarily a cardiac related incident and that incident has occurred unexpectedly and suddenly. In the UK it's estimated that around 100,000 people a year experience a sudden cardiac arrest and only 8% are discharged from hospital to go home alive. So what do we mean by sequelae? Well, sequelae is a condition which is the consequence of a previous disease or injury. If you had diabetes, an, an example of a sequelae from that would be poor blood flow to the feet when you have a cardiac arrest. Typically, you will be seen in a cardiac specialist centre. And so usually any immediate issues that you have regarding to that um, arrest are usually addressed well. Otherwise, you wouldn't come out of the hospital alive. And that might be that you get um, medications or you get a stent if you've got a, a if you've had a heart attack. But further cardiac issues like heart failure or if you've got cardiomyopathy or you need some surgery or more tests to diagnose channelopathies and things like that again they're usually dealt with pretty well by the cardiac centers but we've got to remember some sequelae don't always come from the actual cardiac incident they can do if you as I mentioned if you have a heart failure because of a heart attack but you may also get them because of medications that you prescribed or you can get them from um, the event downtime essentially that's caused problems beyond the heart and it, it's easily to get all of these sort of uh, mixed up or, confl or conflate the symptoms together because quite often they're hard to distinguish between them. And when I say um, beyond the heart, one of the primary causes is anoxia or hypoxia. And these words describe the ox oxygen deprivation and its impact on its brain. Anoxia is the worst type and it's a complete lack of oxygen to the brain, whereas hypoxia is a reduced supply of oxygen to the brain. Quite often they're used interchangeably because people don't know um, how much oxygen you are getting while you're you're receiving CPR? I mean, because um, blood carries oxygen to your organs and to your brain, and when you're receiving CPR, there's no sort of easy way of measuring that. And so you may be getting to uh, getting oxygen to your brain, but there's no way of knowing the the amount. So it might have been a, you might have been in a hypoxic or a anoxic state. It's also worth remembering that the brain is is roughly only 2% of your body's weight, but it consumes 20% of the body's oxygen supply. So if you're in a state of hypoxia or anoxia, what, what will normally happen? Well, if anyone's seen you, they might see you in a, a state of cyanosis, which is where... Um, you tend to get a little bit of a bluish tinge or go grey in it on your lips and your mouth and fingers and other extremities. You might see someone having brief jerks, which is known as myoclonus, and or even seizures. And perhaps in the, the sort of final state of a, an arrest is agonal respiration, uh, which is a very harsh gasping type noises. If you want to know anything more about uh, agonal respiration, there's a, a page on our website specifically on that subject. But also one of the other effects of 
oxygen deprivation is is damage to the cells in the brain and they are particularly sensitive to oxygen oxygen deprivation and that can lead to brain swelling or inflammation in the brain as well which is um, equally dangerous which is why a lot of us will um, have been called when we are in when we actually get to the hospital they quite, or even sometimes before if you're seen by a HEMS or a specialist team they will put you into calling to try and prevent the brain from swelling any more than the, than necessary and some centres um, take part in this um, targeted temperature management trial where they get the the temperature down a couple of degrees to below the actual normal temperature and there's still some debate as to whether that actually is beneficial or not so don't worry if you didn't get it the the key is normally to stop someone having inflammation or going into a fever and that, that's because the the brain is particularly sensitive to oxygen deprivation and some of those areas are the cerebral cortex which plays a big part in person's intelligence and their personality their motor function processing sensory information and, and language and also the hippocampus which is very important in in people's memory and the basal ganglia and cerebellum which are both important in the control of movement. Some of the longer term effects from anoxia or hypoxia will vary very much for how long and how well the CPR was um, given and how soon you got CPR. And the longer term effects can be reversible depending on how much damage has occurred. So if you only received mild or short lived anoxia, there may well be recovery back to your normal level or near normal level. But if the injury has been more marked, the outcome is, will be less certain and certainly more likely to experience longer term effects. These longer term effects will vary from person to person. Um, and there's no, there's no hard and fast rules about all of these I've seen and spoken to people who have been down for a long time and have minimal effects where I've seen others that have been down for a very short time and have profound effects. The severity of, of, of these injuries and the brain areas that are affected can affect the, the sort of the symptoms that you see in someone or the sequelae that you see in them and it is, can be quite a wide range of difficulties that can occur although not all of these difficulties are seen in every one. Just going into a little bit more about the some of the longer term effects and the sort of areas of the brain that are affected. I'm not a doctor and I've taken a lot of this information from some of the primary sort of resources I use when advising people about their conditions or the problems that they um, speak about in the group or to me personally. I get this information from Headways, uh, the primary resource in the UK. One of the primary areas that can be affected is the cerebral cortex, the cerebellum, basal ganglia, and all of these can lead to limb weaknesses, disturbances of movement, balance and coordination. The occipital lobe is the main visual centre and is particularly sensitive to anoxia which can give you loss of vision or other visual conditions. And I mentioned previously about the hippocampus, where it can affect your memory, and that's a, that's a very common problem with people. Disturbances of speech and language function uh, may occur in articulation of speech, finding the right word or the missing word syndrome, and understanding language and spoken and written communications may also be affected and if you are unlucky enough to get frontal lobe damage it may affect your executive function this is the ability to reason and think and to synthesize and integrate complex information and make um, considered judgments and decisions about what to do in a particular situation or or how to plan and function effectively in a social setting. 
frontal lobe damage may also produce changes in your personality, including irritability, poor tolerance, impulsiveness and impairments in social perception and conduct, apathy, lack of insight, agitation, mood swings and depression come under that sort of range of frontal lobe damage. As you can see, it can affect you quite badly. And quite often, or a number of times, I've seen in the group people have have talked about inability to regulate their body temperature or, or their weight And if you're really unlucky, your um, hypothalamus or the pituitary gland can be affected, which is affects your hormonal levels. And it can, as I said, can affect all sorts of things like body temperature and tiredness and weakness and even skin conditions and headaches. It's probably worth noting that quite often we are seen because we're a cardiac patient in a a cardiology ward and we're not necessarily seen by someone who's expert in brain injury. But quite often we will be assessed at a very basic level and you're given quite often that one of the categories or the, the scalings ratings that they use is something called the CPC, which is the cerebral performance category. And that's very uh, coarse in its uh, gradings in that there's only five, whereas five is brain death, um, four is a coma and vegetative state, three is someone who's rated as severe, but they're essentially disabled but dependent on others for their daily support. And in our group, we're primarily probably going to be one and a There may be a few people who are two. And one is good, um, essentially, which they say is someone who can lead a normal life. Um, They're able to work and do the sorts of things that normal people do. But they may have minor psychological or neurological deficits. And a two is moderate, which is um, sort of slightly disabled but they are independent and they've got sufficient cerebral function for part-time work in a sheltered environment and can do independent activities of daily life. So it's just worth knowing that the types of people who are functioning on Facebook within the group who comment are typically ones that are classed as good but that um still allows the fact that they may have psychological or neurological problems. When um, I've done previous talks where I've helped out with uh, Dr. Tom Keeble presenting some of his study to his colleagues and beyond, I've talked about uh, my own, own personal experience and what I've seen others going through in the group and I I tended to um, title these under three headings they were physical sequelae psychological sequelae and and life or probably better known as psychosocial and what I meant by the physical issues are things like fatigue and tiredness the memory problems the speech language and cognition um which I now know is, uh, or the speak and, speech and language, is aphasia uh, or dif- dysphasia, which again, on the website, we have a page on that. Um, headache and what some people term as brain fog, where you can't really think clearly, you feel like you've got, I don't know, got old, old socks stuffed in your head and you can't think properly. Light and sound sensitivity, lack of ability to concentrate and focus clearly and other impairments such as myoclonus which I mentioned earlier sort of like body jerks uncontrollable movements and also dizziness and and balance issues. I also talked about psychological issues such as abandonment and feeling alone whether these are strictly sequelae or not I'm not quite sure. I've included them as as part of my talks as that. Um, Something I call the serendipity paradox, which is the feeling you get that you're alive. You're one of the luckiest people to have survived an event like that, bearing in mind so few do. But the fact that you're you're changed, you're different, you struggle to find 
who you really are and that that journey can be a little bit of a take a time to process and for some people it's 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 a very hard uphill struggle emotionally you can be very changed and have uh, all, you swing swing all over the place in terms of being happy and being sad and crying uncontrollably people go through personality changes as i mentioned earlier various areas of the brain can be affected can affect your personality people become anxious about whether it's going to happen again maybe they don't feel comfortable that what what's happened to them their the resolution of their potential problems like for example if they had a heart attack and they didn't get an ICD they become anxious because they haven't got an ICD and other people who have an ICD sometimes are anxious that they've got that ICD in there which is uh, a safety blanket if you like but if you get a shock it can be quite devastating to that person it may save their life if it's an appropriate one but if it's inappropriate and you can sometimes have multiple ones it, it can be quite devastating and of course there's the PTSD some people some survivors do actually remember their event many don't but some do and it can be quite uh, quite traumatizing and all of these sort of um, effects on the brain and the, your life can lead to PTSD for some people and, and even depression and one thing I experienced was a, a panicked attack when I revisited the hospital I don't know what was going on when that happened but uh, it was a very scary um, episode and people I talk about having amnesia where your memory is not so great but some people can lose whole chunks of memory um, luckily for someone like me I only lost uh, a couple of weeks which tends to be quite typical but others I've heard of who've lost months and years and that that can be a uh, quite distressing at times and of course there's always the the what and the why's of life and why did I get saved and you know has this a bigger meaning for me um, should I dedicate my new life to something different um, you know in some ways for many people it can be a bit of a midlife crisis post arrest and then uh, the final sort of group I termed as psychosocial which was uh, life essentially and it was just acknowledging that the fact that the event can affect um, more than just the partner it can affect the um, it can affect more than the, just the survivor it can affect the partner or people who are involved in the rescue um, and they can end up with PTSD and your wider family whether that be the way that you interact with them and your relationships because if your personality has changed or you're very emotional uh, or irritable the, the family dynamic can be uh, changed and also from a medical point of view if you have a condition which um, needs to be checked out from a, a genetic point of view that can create, create all sorts of stresses and strains and sometimes people don't even get that which can be a stress and a strain in its own right and of course there's all the other things like you know getting back to recreation and doing sports and being able to um, work again and again these aren't typically what you might call sequelae but there are things that can sort of happen because of what's happened to you so Previously, I have done surveys in the group about what the um, most common sequelae they are experiencing. And we had several hundred respond to this. So I think it's it's reasonably accurate as to a good representation of what people have experienced. And the top two are, which were quite clearly the top two, were fatigue and short-term memory issues so if you've been feeling exhausted or tired since your cardiac arrest you're you're in good company and that can be to a certain degree down to medications um, particularly if you're put on beta blockers like bisoprolol 
um, because they are known to sort of slow you down a little bit. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, damage to the, to the brain and to um, other organs can can cause uh, excessive tiredness and fatigue. And I think there's still a lot of research to be done in this area to understand why it occurs, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of answers out there and a lot of people suffering with it. The um, next one down was poor concentration and focus. That was the sort of the, those top two, the fatigue and the short memory issues, were by by some way the the top two, and then the third one was the concentration. And then a little bit below that was emotional swings and sleep issues and anxiety. And then below that was brain fog, as I mentioned earlier, the lack of being able to think clearly. Then comes depression, personality changes and PTSD. Then panic attacks, speech and language and sensory issues. Sensory issues is where um, maybe you're uh, hypersensitive to loud noises or or particular types of light or um, many people speaking or noise um, it, it can be too much for your brain to handle and you need to go to a, a, a quiet area or a, a dark area. Another level down and we go to phobias, um, which is strange for some people, but I know, I know quite a few people who have developed a phobia of crowds or of going on public transport or even agoraphobia. Um and I think this is perhaps linked to trust in their own bodies that they're worried it's going to happen again and they're going to be out of control. And then we've got executive dysfunction, which is uh, the, the inability to th- think and process uh, inputs properly and plan properly. And then we've got myoclonus, which is the sort of uh, random jerking, headaches and long term memory issue. And then the second from last group are visual issues, um, hormonal imbalances and other issues. There was an option on the survey for lots of people to or for people to comment. And there was a whole host of um, additional reasons that weren't weren't that popular. I didn't have that many people reporting them, although there were a couple that were um, new to me and unusual, which was tinnitus and people having issues with their teeth. Um, But I know there is a a link with heart and teeth, so um, perhaps that's there. You're probably thinking, well, well, what about all of these issues? Yes, okay, uh, I do experience some of those. Can I do anything about it? Well, the prognosis um, of recovery of these things is still quite very difficult especially in the early stages if someone you love is in the hospital you're in the hospital as a survivor um, it is difficult for doctors to to give accurate information so rather than giving inaccurate information they tend to be quite cautious in what they say which is totally understandable but there's a couple of um, things I could add that that I've seen that Older people tend not to respond as well as perhaps um, people younger than 60 or so. Um, And younger people tend to do slightly better than middle-aged people. It's a bit of a cliche, but I think it is true that time is a great healer. I know many people in the group um, and myself uh, have improved over time and you might get told that you're you're only improve up to the first year or whatever but you will see the most rapid recovery um, usually within the first six months and but and by one year or so you you were sort of your um, path of recovery will have sort of settled and you will get, get a, a clear idea of what your perhaps your long-term outcome will be but that's not to say you can't can't continue improving over the um next few years because i definitely think um, i've seen people who've gone through uh, 
a lot of improvement over more than one year. Yeah, probably myself to a certain degree. But there's some things that just don't go away. And I know that many, uh, I, I did another survey and there was many people, I think I, I think it was around 60% of people who uh, completed the survey said that they still had uh, many deficits more than two years um, later. That's not to say that they hadn't improved, but they've still had some problems. Unfortunately, at the moment in the UK, and probably a lot of other places worldwide as well, there is no um, pathway for cardiac arrest survivors regarding these type of issues. If you've had a heart attack as the cause of your cardiac arrest, you may be able to access some cardiac rehab and that is generally considered to be very good from everyone I know who's uh, attended it, but they don't always make it specific to people who may have a, a brain injury or some of the psychological issues that I've talked about. If you do have a brain injury and you'd like to find out more about it, there are quite a few pages on our website. That's the Southern Cardiac Arrest UK.org website. And if you go to slash acquired dash brain dash injury, there's a page about all, all sorts of stuff regard, regarding brain injury and a whole list of um, organisations that may be able to help. And a little more on recovery. If you're taking medications, which you should always take your medications that you've um, been prescribed, but some of those can have side effects like fatigue and maybe affect your memory. Some of them you can get used to, um, but if not, do ask uh, about whether there's any alternatives because quite often there are and what is okay for one person may not be okay for you. So do ask. There is more and more evidence these days for how diet affects us and it can influence the our microbiome, uh, which is our, our stomach, and how that affects our brain and by utilizing the correct diet we can actually improve our own brain neurogenesis and our mental health consequently which can help with PTSD and anxiety and depression. As I mentioned if you can get cardiac rehab do go for it and do it. There's a thing called phase four as well which not everyone can get access to but it's worth if you can get a good case together, you can go to your GP or even your cardiologist and try and access that as well. Because doing fitness and getting active, it can be a real positive aspect of your recovery, even if that's just walking or running. And um, we've got some virtual fitness clubs, which if, again, if you go to the website, there's a page under that, which will list things as a Strava and as a Fitbit club and there's even a, a park run uh, club which if you want to join. Another idea would be to learn a new skill that's proven to build new pathways within your brain and help you. The jury is out on this next one which is brain training. Um, I'm sure you've seen lots of, sort of computer type games and things like that. They're popular and they are fun to do but the jury is out whether these actually do any good and help your brain or whether you just get good at the games. Another technique is to write your experience down. That can help with overcoming the trauma and there is a an actual therapy called uh, expressive writing where you write down your trauma or what you remember about your trauma three or four days consecutively just for 15-20 minutes a day and that's supposed to have really good results. Another way of trying to overcome some of these uh, sequelae is to meet your saviours. There's a real positive aspect to this because it helps you get over some of those feelings. And it also is uh, a great experience for the, the people who saved you, typically ambulance crew. So I'd really recommend doing that. And if you can give back in any other way by maybe putting an AED in your community, that can help with some of the the feelings of helplessness and, and sometimes the, the sort of the mental aspect of it all. And if you are struggling with anything mentally and you're a member of Sudden Cardiac Arrest UK, 
don't forget that you can get up to six free sessions of therapy in your area with a trained professional. And to access that, you need to contact uh, SADS UK, which there's information on the um, Southern Cardiac Arrest UK website under counselling. And finally, if you do struggle with anything else, do go back to your GP and speak to them. I know they don't always understand and it is difficult getting through in that short time, but many people I know um, have had success doing that. Um, but that's, that's the main point of, of where you should have contact apart from your cardiologist and they, they aren't always able to help you. But hopefully things will change in the future and there's um, plans afoot to try and improve things for cardiac arrest survivors but unfortunately that won't that won't happen there just like that so i'm pretty much done on this episode now for sequela i hope you uh, have learned a few things and understand what the word means and if you've got any questions um on this subject or any other subject please do contact me at info at southern cardiac arrest org. so Thanks very much for listening and I'll speak to you again sometime soon. Thank you.